from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Airbnb is beating its own pre-pandemic records, despite Omicron dragging on. We'll explore the travel rebound in their fourth quarter results. Plus, Grubhub gets more convenient, teaming up with 7-Eleven. How the collaboration fits into a broader strategy to fend off DoorDash and Uber. An actor turned creative ad genius Ryan Reynolds gives us his take on the Super Bowl's crypto ad takeover. How his agency is promising to bring Super Bowl level ads to clients all year long. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the market. Stocks climbing, bonds falling with the dollar as speculation uh, continued about inflation and tension eased on the Ukrainian border. Our Ed Ludlow here to break it all down. Ed. Yeah, it's really a risk on kind of day. There's a lot going on in the world, the market being sanguine, and you see U.S. equities in particular seeing some strength. The outperformance in the technology sector, you see that in the Nasdaq 100 gaining 2.5%, biggest jump in two weeks, outperforming the S&P 500. And you're right, we're paying close attention to yields because it's interesting, U.S. 10-year yield is above 2% for the first time since July of 2019, but that didn't really deter investors on higher multiple tech stocks. The outperformance really was in semiconductors, the Philadelphia Semiconductor index up five and a half percent a big part of that call of course the intel tower acquisition we're going to talk about later in the show coming into my bloomberg terminal i want to focus on this idea of yield it's interesting white line is the relative performance of the nasdaq 100 to the s p 500 the blue line u.s 10-year yield it's on the up but who cares we're bullish today we're going in for it in the tech sector and you see those gains Partly, of course, fueled by positivity around earnings season. Speaking of earnings season, back here in the studio, we're looking at Airbnb, of course, and Roblox. Roblox, ooh, that's ugly in after hours. You know, they were kind of softer on activity use in, uh, users and activity in the fourth quarter. The number of hours that folks are spending on the platform is down. But the CEO has a, a basically a pitch. Stick with us. The metaverse is distant. But it, we are a long-term play. Airbnb, very different story. Higher around 4% in after hours this Tuesday. They're basically performing with the stay-at-home crowd, those people that are still working from home, perhaps in a city outside of their thing. This is the chart I want to bring up for your next guest, though. This is a stock that's underperformed its peers because, remember, there's still a question around higher multiple stocks and the outlook for rates. And Airbnb, frankly, higher multiple stocks. Right, absolutely. All right, Ed, we're going to dig into Airbnb results a bit further now. Thank you, Brent Thill of Jeffries with us. Brent, Airbnb is beating its own pre-pandemic records, even as the pandemic is dragging on. What's your headline takeaway here? Everyone's tired of doing Zooms and sitting at home. So, like, everyone's just eager to get out. And, and I think what Airbnb is enabling is new way of work, which is, you know, no one really cares where we're at. We're just doing our work. So, when you look at the the average uh, daily, uh, you know, the stay length, you know, they're pushing seven plus days and on on half of their business. I mean, these are not you know weekend stays. They, families are committing and taking their kids out of school or, or going, uh, 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 you know, uh, other places than just at their home and taking advantage of this environment that we're in. And so I, I think ultimately you've got. Uh, a beat and a raise. You've got uh, great uh, growth on average daily night rates uh, that have potential to go higher. You continue to have a uh, lengthening stay. And I think they're making it easier for us to adjust and to live at Airbnbs rather than just visit. And that's key, right? You have to have fast wireless. You have to have the right infrastructure. And I think ultimately this hybrid environment is, is benefiting and it will only get better. And, and the one thing that's key is they've talked about uh, the actual return to city. So urban was a huge uh, negative drag on their business during, during COVID. No one wanted to be in New York City or San Francisco. That's now coming back. The other thing is cross-border, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but every one of my friends wants to go to Europe this summer, right? So when you think about the borders are opening, I went across the Canadian border recently, and it was great to go back into Canada. We couldn't do it for two years. So this cross-border return to cities, that's another big driver. Uh, we still like the stock from here and think, uh, you know, many of the travel names are are, are set to go higher as we, we as we clear through this uh, this this current round of the pandemic. So 
Here's my question. What does Airbnb look like when the pandemic is really in the rearview mirror? I mean, long-term stays were going up going into the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated long-term stays. But then does that plateau when, you know, life kind of stabilizes one way or another? And what does that mean for Airbnb? It, you know, it could it could into 2023. I think we're still in a not normal time, right? So the real question is, do employers require all their employees to be back in the office? Are, are you know, I, I think we're going to have a lot of pent up demand and travel for a while, right? So, you know, right now it's hard to find, you know, for example, if you want to go to Europe this summer, it's already hard to find a spot. Like, for example, in Greece, where my wife wants to go, hard to find a place right now already for the summer. So there's a there's a long tail. And I think, listen to what Google said on their earnings call. They saw massive search results for travel. You're seeing this in, in all of our due diligence from the Jefferies tech team across what's happening in the travel ecosystem and what's happening with airlines and everything else. Th th this, is, this is pent up and this is gonna last, I think through 2022 into early 23. But to your point, I think, you know, what Airbnb is trying to shift this towards is, I think we are gonna be a hybrid environment and this enables us to go uh, work our lives, you know, before, right. We used to come to the studio and sit down. Now we're, we're joining via zoom. Like this is right. a different world and that world is not going to go back to the same world we were in. And so I think that I, just it, benefits the Airbnb story for, for quite some time. Well, what about the Expedia story? I interviewed Peter Kern last week. He said they're looking at their best summer ever coming up ahead. Take a quick listen to what he had to say. Well, I expect big cities and international travel is probably the next big win, including hopefully international air, because you can't get there without a plane. And that's been a tough part of the air business. Uh, I think corporate probably lags somewhat behind that. But uh, but we do expect that those places will start to fill up as more and more people get on the road. Brent, do you see these companies rising together or does one have an edge given that inventory is such a huge part of succeeding in the short or long term rental business? We think booking is going to have a, a big year because most of the revenue is outside North America. So, you know, booking is a is a big recovery play for us. We think uh, obviously the growth of Europe and Asia will help them disproportionately. Expedia, um, uh, to answer your question, like they're all going to do well this year, but Expedia does well because they have a lot of cost hangover and there there's a lot of issues going on there. The U.S. is recovering faster, so Expedia works in the U.S. Booking works for the international exposure. And then, you know, Airbnb works for the alternative uh, segment of the market. So it's a, it's a terrible answer that everything is going to work. But I, I think it is in this environment because there's such pent up demand. Anyone that has had COVID is like, I'm ready. Let's go. I got my bags packed. Right. And, and most of us that we know have had COVID. So they're ready to roll. And so there's enormous pent up energy. There's little limitation to price. Uh, I, I think, you know, we're going to see a lot more ad hoc travel. And even you know, you know, long range travel is getting planned out further now, uh, from what I we can tell in our in our research. So I think it's a I think it's a really good year. And to your question, I think the biggest risk is like, are we going to have a hangover in you know in in, in twenty three from from all the all the travel that we took this year? All right, Brent Thill, Jeffrey's analyst. Thank you as always for joining us. I'm actually going to be speaking with Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky in the next hour, so stay tuned. To Bloomberg Television. Meantime, Elon Musk has reported that he gave about $5.7 billion worth of Tesla shares to charity back in November. The donation was one of the biggest ever, thrusting him to the top or near the top of the list of the most generous philanthropists. The name of the charity is not in the filing. A large charitable donation would help reduce what Musk claimed would be the biggest tax bill in U.S. history. Coming up, it is all about the metaverse. Companies betting big on it, but can they deliver a top metaverse investor? With us next. This is Bloomberg. Metaverse is just like, what does that mean, really? Regardless of where you want to call it, whatever it may be. This is a very exciting opportunity for Mattel. I think it's a great opportunity for us. I think it's the next great horizon for Disney. The Metaverse, uh, NFTs, and other digital opportunities, digital experiences, 
will give us an opportunity to engage with consumers. We believe that there's a world where we can add a third dimension of storytelling. I think virtual reality is inevitable that there are going to be a lot of different ways that people experience events. If you mean the metaverse, like, are we all going to be wearing VR headsets and staying in our houses all the time? I think that's, you know, if we're lucky enough to emerge from our caves after this pandemic, I think at least for the next three to five years, people are going to be more excited to engage in real life than ever before. While the metaverse may be a term that seems far out in the future for some, but investors are hopping on the bandwagon and placing their bets now. According to Bloomberg Intelligence, metaverse ETFs could balloon to $80 billion in assets under management by 2024, as funds capture a slice of this massive market for 3D virtual social worlds. Joining us now, one of the first to spot this trend, he launched an ETF in the earlier days, Matthew Ball, Apillion Co's CEO, with us now. Matthew, great to have you here. I, did, I want to start on Roblox results because we're seeing shares take a tumble there. And I'm curious just how powerful you think Roblox will ultimately be in this metaverse of the future. I think the interesting thing is how potent is their flywheel already today? In this last quarter, we saw the company invest more in R&D than they had in revenue only seven quarters ago. They're spending more on the next 12 months in their own platform than three times the most expensive game in history. Grand Theft Auto V, Red Dead Redemption 2, cost $250 million over five years to make, market, and produce. That's the potency of having 250 million monthly active users, one quarter of which use the platform per day, and $2 billion plus in revenue. The question is, will that investment pay off? Sounds like you think it will. It seems to be. I think investors do look a little bit disappointed with the user and usage growth in this last quarter. And yet we're already seeing in January figures that they disclosed the largest month over month leap in either of those two metrics. 4.2 billion hours of usage. The prior peak was 3.8. 55 million daily active users. The prior peak in December was 49.4. We're dozens and dozens and dozens of quarters into ongoing growth in all core metrics. I don't anticipate those slowing anytime soon. Disney just appointed a metaverse executive. We heard Bob Chapek there talking about their metaverse strategy, and now they've got a person in charge of this strategy. Which companies do you think are going to win here, whether it's Roblox or Disney or Meta or Microsoft or companies we're not talking about yet? We launched the ETF in June of last year because we believe that this was a multi-trillion dollar opportunity that was going to span hundreds, if not thousands, of successful companies. We talk about the big five tech companies today, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and yet even with 1.4 trillion in revenues last year, they were less than 15% of digital economy revenues. I think there are going to be a number of different so-called winners. NVIDIA, an obvious candidate. Amazon looks likely, Microsoft as well. But we're going to see many Unities and Epic Games who in a span of months go from a single digit billion valuation to tens if not more. Well, speaking of how far ahead of the curve or the ball you were, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook actually bought the meta ticker from you. Can you tell us the story of how they reached out and how much they paid up? I can't actually because they didn't purchase anything from, from me. I produce the index. Uh, my company, Ball Metaverse Research Partners, produces the index, which is licensed to Roundhill, which then uses it for the construction of the Roundhill Ball Metaverse ETF. And then on top of that, I believe the ticker is actually the property of the exchanges. All right. Do you think Meta's strategy will succeed? Is Mark Zuckerberg going to get this right? I think the way to think about it is, does IBM's mainframe strategy matter today? Does having a PC-focused strategy actually lead to success? These can be fine businesses. The social network is not going away anytime soon. But the future, these social and virtual 3D worlds, we're on the cusp of that future already. Facebook is losing users not just to TikTok, but to Roblox. We know where young people are. 75% of those 9 to 12 use Roblox alone on a frequent basis. And so whether or not their strategy is right or wrong, they need to focus on the metaverse. Their $10 billion hit from ATT, Apple's policy changes, actually reiterates the importance of having your own hardware and operating system as well. So that's companies. What about the regions? Do you have a region that you think 
could win the metaverse. For example, Korea recently launched eight metaverse ETFs, and I wonder what mm -hmm. you think. Over the past 15 years, we've seen an increasing regionalization of the internet. That's a mixture of regulatory approaches, most notably the EU and China, but also increases in the local markets startup community. South Korea has been strong for quite some time, Southeast Asia, the African continent as well. And so my expectation will be that as more of society moves to virtual worlds, we'll see more dominant local companies. China is already closing its walls more than ever. The South Korean government has assigned the South Korean Metaverse Alliance, which spans 450 companies from Hyundai down to their largest local banks. And so it does seem likely that we're going to see increased clustering in this virtual world, much like we saw in Silicon Valley physically. Now, physically in, in Silicon Valley, we've already seen the regular old internet having trouble dealing with challenges and hard problems, misinformation, harassment. How do you see these companies dealing with these challenges in virtual worlds? And can they really manage this? I think that's the big challenge. Look, if we go back 15 years ago, many of the challenges we face today were not foreseeable. Election engineering, tampering, the degree to which misinformation, harassment, and the uploading of illicit materials and, frankly, horrific acts of terrorism, we underestimated most of them, but we're still struggling with how we can actually solve that problem. Facebook has 50,000 content moderators. I would assume that if hiring another 10,000 solved the problem, they would have done that long ago. And so I'm optimistic that at least the provenance of these companies, game companies who focus on happiness, on fun, we may get addicted to a social network even though we don't love using it, but we don't play games unless we feel good. And so I'm hopeful that this new crop of companies will bring a different philosophy. That's an interesting take. All right, Matthew Ball, always great to have you with us. Thanks for stopping by. Another story we're following meantime, Intel has stepped up its push into outsourced chip making. The company has agreed to buy Tower Semiconductor for about $5.4 billion, Tower based in Israel. It makes power management chips, image sensors, and a variety of other semiconductors. Coming up, Grubhub expanding with 7-Eleven. This as the company is trying to make up ground it's losing to rival delivery services. More on the move next. This is Bloomberg. More than 112 million people watched the LA Rams beat the Cincinnati Bengals to win the Super Bowl. Most of the viewers, more than 99 million of them, tuned into the game on NBC. More than 11 million watched on Peacock, the company's streaming platform. Sunday's game was the most watched since 2015 when more than 114 million people watched the Patriots hold on to beat the Seahawks. That game was also on NBC. And speaking of the Super Bowl, Uber used its coveted spot to remind everyone that it delivers more than just food. Now Grubhub has announced it's collaborating with 7-Eleven to compete with Uber as well as DoorDash to expand into convenience items beyond restaurant takeout. For more on the delivery wars, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos. Jackie, what is their strategy to compete with DoorDash and Uber on this issue, this, this category, which seems to be the next battleground? Absolutely. And you have to remember that Grubhub has actually had convenience items on its platform almost since its inception. Uh, but what it's really trying to do here is expand that footprint even further across the U.S. through this partnership. And it's doing this uh, in, a, in a unique strategy that I think um, is very important to understand because of Grubhub's uh, business model that does differ quite a bit from uh, a DoorDash or an Uber. So what it's doing here is kind of taking this, you know, suburban area where it's traditionally lagged, where you find a lot of these 7-Elevens, um, and then looking to also couple that with with the strategy with dark stores, which, you know, they really thrive in these dense uh, urban environments where Grubhub actually got its start in Chicago and has another really great foothold in, in New York. And so what it's trying to do here is really chip away at a really sticky category. DoorDash has gotten into it with Dash Marts. Uber Eats has that partnership.
relationship with GoPuff, GoPuff really dominates this first party convenience category. And I think Grubhub is looking to chip away at, at that market share um, through this partnership. How does this help their core food delivery business, which is clearly being challenged by companies that are bigger and potentially have deeper pockets. Absolutely. You know, and this is one of the biggest challenges that has really come to the surface for, for Grubhub. They've completely uh, lagged, especially DoorDash, who's gobbled up a lot of that market share, again, because of their foothold in suburban markets. So really what this convenience category can do is get more users onto the platform more frequently. Convenience uh, has shown to be uh, this kind of category that increases not just the frequency, but the spend. And so overall, they're really hoping to get those volumes up and prove to investors that uh, there's still a player to be reckoned with. And Grubhub, the parent company, Just Eat Takeaway, they, they, there's been pressure to sell them off, right? Or, or spin them off. What's the status of that? You know, the CEO of Grubhub, Adam DeWitt, dismissed a lot of that chatter. He reaffirmed, you know, Jet's uh, Just Eat Takeaway's commitment to growing the Grubhub business. But there is a mount, mounting pressure from investors that are saying, look, DoorDash just keeps getting bigger. Uber's catching up. Where does this leave Grubhub? They really need to look for new areas of growth in order to make that a convincing argument that they do have a future in the food delivery space. So you know, what's going to be the sticking point, the flashpoint that defines the delivery wars over the next year between Uber and DoorDash and Grubhub? You know, who, who's going to win? This is an interesting question, which I think, uh, you know, it's beyond my pay grade, Emily. But <laughs> what I can say is that what investors tell me is that this cross-platform strategy is really what's going to be a lasting driver of growth. After the pandemic uh, surge really wanes and starts to ease, we start seeing more people really go back to their normal behaviors. We're still going to see delivery have a place, but it's all about what times of the day can you get people? How can you increase those battles? basket sizes and make this almost, you know, in, um, uh, in, in, you know, a part of your life that you just cannot, um, you know, take away. And, right. and it's pretty addictive, especially when you can get it in 10 minutes. So there's a lot of room there. Jackie Davalos, thank you for that report. Coming up, get your sweat on. We're going to talk about the future of connected fitness with Payal Kadakia, founder and executive chair of ClassPass. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get an update now on how the markets are doing and what's on the move as you see it. Yeah, the really interesting one was Intel and Tower Semiconductor, that Israeli business, right? This is M&A. We've got a deal. Intel to buy Tower for $5.4 billion. You can see what the market thought of, thought of it. Tower surging 42%. What's interesting is Tower on that jump trading at $47 a share. Intel has agreed to buy Tower at $53 a share. So even with a 42% jump, it's a hell of a premium that Intel's playing. But this is about getting into that contract manufacturing space, right, M? Intel wants to build semiconductors for others, and that is what Tower does. It's a contract manufacturer, and what Intel will get with some of that is some of Tower's clients. But it's a tiny business. It's like a $1.3 billion business annually compared to, say, a Taiwan semiconductor, which is tens of billions of business. That was where I was looking. But I'm also looking at Peloton. Interesting. A nice day for Peloton, an up day for Peloton. But frankly, that is after three savage days of declines. And Bloomberg's Mark Gurman out with a scoop late on Monday night that some really senior folks on the supply chain team in particular departing the company. We know that's a big part of the strategy to scale down and rethink the business format. But the market cheering it after what was essentially a three-day bloodbath uh, on Tuesday, the stock higher. Maybe the sense here that the market thinks a leaner, meaner peloton that's focused on content, less on hardware, might be the way to go. All right. Ed, thank you. Well, as we make our way through and out of the pandemic, some companies hit harder than others, like Peloton. It's sweeping overhaul, which brought new management and layoffs to the fitness company last week, included the departures of executives running its operations, its supply chain, and other functions, according to folks 
with knowledge of the situation, where is the future of fitness and connected fitness headed? Let's bring in our next guest to talk about that and more. Pyle Kadakia is the author of the book Life Pass and the founder and executive chair of Class Pass. Pyle, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you. I'm curious what your take is on what's going on with Peloton now, given that a key part of what you talk about out in your book is how you had to change gears with class pass in the earlier days but a lot of tech startups sometimes make the wrong choices there they push a product on the market rather than trying to fill a need you know i think the founders in general always need to keep their why in place and i think peloton very similar to even the journey of class pass you have to just stay resilient through all these moments i think you know ClassPass started a long time ago. It was, wasn't even just focused on fitness. It was focused on bringing experiences and passions to people. Peloton came in and completely transformed the entire fitness landscape. And they did it in an innovative way. And I think the key is, is to keep that innovation alive through these changes, through customer behavior changes that we're going to see on the other side of the pandemic. What is your take on the future of fitness? Is it at home? Is it in the gym? Is it running around? the park and you know how does any one company have that vision of the future right yeah i mean you have to listen to your customers your customers are the ones who are going to tell you no founder ceo can tell you what the future of fitness is exactly going to be what we can say is here's what we're seeing in terms of customer behavior and we have learned through the pandemic people have ripped that band-aid off of working out at home which is great for the industry it's great for people's lives and we do see that a hybrid model will probably coexist in the future of at home working out as well as going out and keep going to studios. So what do you think is the mistake that Peloton made? Because clearly there was demand, people wanted it, but did they just overshoot? You know, it's hard to always predict these things as a pandemic happens, right? And these, these world changes happen. It's hard to know how long they are going to happen. But look, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we all hope we wouldn't stay in it forever. So it really is probably just overshooting and over prescribing how many subscribers they would get and how many people were going to buy these bikes as, you know, we started turning on the pandemic. And we knew that there was going to be a rush. I think, you know, there are companies like Mirror, which sold early on in the pandemic. And those were great times for those companies to sell because you really don't get hockey stick growth just automatically. And this was obviously circumstantial for these companies. That's, you know, happened in class passes growth too, as the studio boutique fitness market was growing as well. And I think it's really about thinking about what's going on in time. And, you know, luckily we are getting to the other side of this, but that doesn't always mean the great things for all businesses, the same way the pandemic meant really terrible times for a lot of companies as well. Do you think the market is at all oversaturated with the big hardware, whether it is a Peloton bike or Tonal or Mirror? You know, it's hard for me to say. I, I've always focused on in-person working out. That's really been the heart and soul of ClassPass. We have dabbled in video, but our heart and soul has been getting people to class. I think there's a lot of ways for people to work out. What we've always been focused on is making fitness accessible, right? Because that to me is the hardest thing. It is getting that person who doesn't know how to work out to try it for the first time. And that is really what it's all about. And sometimes equipment can be scary. So I think sometimes the easier you can make it, the better and actually bigger market share you're going to have. Well, some offices I'm, I'm learning are even offering a class pass subscription to get their workers to come back to the office. What do you think about that? And 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 what do you, what trends do you think we're gonna see as the world reopens? But Customers have been introduced to this, you know, opportunity to work from home and work out from home. I mean, working out is an essential part of all of our lives. None of us should be sitting at our desk all day long working without getting out of the office. It's always been a part of my life and it's always been a culture of our company as well. And I think that's really what has been so amazing to see is how many companies are investing in their employees and, you know, people in their team's health. And that really is the key is we need to know that our employees being healthy means that they're going to be more productive and happier doing their jobs. Women entrepreneurs got just 2% of venture capital last year, which is stunningly low, despite the Me Too movement, the Me Too movement in Silicon Valley in particular. What needs to change in your view still? 
bigger, bigger ideas from female founders. Think big and get those bigger checks, right? I think obviously we're seeing progress on the seed rounds and series A rounds, but we need progress later on and we need more women also handing out those, those checks at the later stages. You know, as, as a founder who was able to build a company that raised her series E and also we got acquired at the end of last year as well. I think going through those changes, I realized that later on in the process, I encountered less and less women and that was really tough for me. And I would have loved to have been able to have shared this with more and more women and have more people, more women on my board, more people championing me. And I think that's really what needs to change is more capital coming from women and more women thinking of these big billion dollar ideas. All right, amen. Kyle Kadaki, a founder and executive chair of Class Pass and author of Life Pass, a new book out now. Thank you. Coming up. Remember how quick that Peloton ad featuring Mr. Big was up and running? We'll talk to the team behind it and many other ads of which Ryan Reynolds is the chief creative officer. Reynolds joining us next to talk about the Super Bowl ads and more. on a three-day winning streak very close to that $45,000 mark. Here now to discuss the price move, Bloomberg Shanali Basik. Shanali, what are we seeing? Yeah, Emily, you really see Bitcoin the last couple of days since the Super Bowl really start to rise back up again. But those first few days, the rise was small. In the last 24 to 48 hours, a little bit bigger, almost 4% 4, 4, uh, 4 rise in Bitcoin prices alone. An even bigger jump when you look at prices of Ethereum, for example, which is close to a 7% rise. Bitcoin volumes, however, were higher. And for those who thought that Bitcoin was a diversifier, you're actually seeing Bitcoin really mimic the stock market in a bigger way here. Risk appetite really rising as geopolitical tensions start to ease, Emily. All right, Shanali, thanks so much for that. I want to go back to the crypto bull for just a moment. I talked about all that and more with Mountain CEO and founder Mark Douglas and actor and Mountain's chief creative officer, Ryan Reynolds. I asked them what worked and didn't work in their opinion when it came to Super Bowl advertising. Take a listen. Well, I think what worked is having an ad that was unlike any other ad and making it, I mean, it was as direct response as you could get. You know, when people are watching TV on their home, they have their phone in their hand, tablet, and this ad basically was like, grab your phone and become a part of this ad. And I don't, I also don't think it's recreatable in the sense. It's like, if, if you do it again, it's just a poor imitation mm -hmm. of the original. So to combine that with like this kind of really, truly direct response ad, probably for the real, truly, you know, the, this direct, one of the first times in history, it's just, it doesn't tell a story. The story is learn about crypto. I think it was pretty amazing. Um, I don't think we'll see it again. And um, I think it took a lot of courage for them to do it. And, and it, it apparently has paid off. So that's great for, for, for that brand. Brian, how about you? What worked? What didn't work? I mean, I certainly clicked on the Coinbase QR code, but then the site went down, and I'm not sure, is that success or what? I don't know. The site going down is, is probably indicative of some serious success, I would guess. I mean, those are, you know, that, that's what's called an uptown problem. Um, you know, I, I always feel like your marketing should move, move as fast as you do, you know? So I think that, you know, that Coinbase ad was great. I mean, in terms of just, you know, I always think that the two biggest obstacles to creativity are, are too much time and too much money. Um, you know, and character always wins out over spectacle, and that ad has character. Uh, it's engaging; it pulls people in. So I thought that was I thought that was fantastic. I loved seeing Paul Rudd and, and Seth uh, in their piece for Lay's. I thought that was great as well. So the crypto ad takeover did this hit the zeitgeist? I mean, it wasn't just Coinbase; it was FTX, it was eToro. There were so many different companies trying to get a slice of our attention. Yeah. And but the you know, but they like like we were just talking about, they cut through. And so and they told us, I, I think what they figured out is everyone is curious about this topic. So let's make an ad that is as direct to learning about it as you can. And it, it was very clever. And when I watch it, it's almost funny in how simple it is. You're kind of laughing like this is it, but it worked. And so um, it was their own way of cutting, cutting through the clutter and almost 
capturing the moment in in the most like direct way possible. I think it, I think it was brilliant, and it's one of a kind. There was one thing missing from that Coinbase ad. Well, a lot of things, including a celebrity. We've seen so many celebrities jumping on this crypto train. Ryan, what's your take on that? Is this just the next bandwagon, or is there something more here? Um, you know, I, I just see that as, as uh, you know, enterprise companies looking to create and carve out uh, space in the zeitgeist, you know, and, and, and sometimes a, a great way to do that is to use celebrities. Sometimes a terrible way to do that is to use celebrities. So I think I think they're, they're, they seem to be uh, uh, for, you know, I think a, a large part doing doing some things pretty well. Um, you know, I enjoyed the LeBron piece. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely something new and it's definitely something that's probably here to stay. Do you own any crypto now? <laughs> I don't really want to comment on that, but you know, I, um, I do, I do, I do see the value in, 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 you know, the, the conversation that we're having right now, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think companies are doing a good job of, of bringing it into a sort of a, a safer, more mainstream light. I mean, 90% of the word crypto is crypt. So, you know, I see why certain, you know, uh, certain folks who might, might, might be put off it or, or intimidated by it or, um, but, you know, I think it's, it's emerging as a, as a huge, huge player. I mean, it's been emerging for a long time as a huge player. So I'm, 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 I'm not super surprised. The proposition of Mountain is that the Super Bowl should happen all year long, right? Your pitch is that you're giving clients Super Bowl level attention whenever they want whether it's a big football day or not, correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's 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 one, one of the great things about maximum effort and what we can do within Mountain is that we can, you know, we have the ability to leverage agile, high impact, creative advertising for TV, you know, and ads are fun. Ads are meant to be fun. We sort of forget that. And, you know, like I said earlier, I think ads, ads that, that the only time that that really suffers is when there's too much time and too much too much money. When you're moving at the speed of culture, there isn't really an opportunity to overthink everything. Um, one of the great things about uh, Mountain and the cast model, the creatives, the subscription uh, model that we use is that it cuts through a ton of the red tape. It's self-service. You know, uh, uh, brands are able to, to create huge impact uh, uh, in a short amount of time. You know, and I and I love that about what we get to do. I think one of the, the biggest tenants uh, of the company is that we've, we've coined it as fast advertising, you know, and that's to say that we do a lot more with a lot less. Uh, and, you know, we're obviously moving at a, at a, at a, at a speed that is, is pretty blinding, you know, by comparatively speaking to how marketing and, and, and ad spaces work traditionally. So, um, you know, and I think that if you can, for us, the ultimate goal always is, and I think that I think maximum effort and mountain do so well together is that you, if you drop into an existing cultural conversation, your brand becomes that conversation, um, and that's the, that's that's really is for at least me and the creative side of things. You know, Mark is more the software side of things, obviously, uh, but for me, that is uh, that's everything. Ryan, you've brought rapid response really to the ad world, and I'm curious that Peloton ad with Chris Noth that you turned so quickly right after the premiere of the Sex and the City reboot. How did that happen? Well, you know, that's a great example of the power of cast, of creative as a subscription. And, you know, they were already hooked, Peloton was already hooked into that system. So it was, it gave us an opportunity to cut through all of the red tape that you would normally, you know, find with it, especially with a company as big as that, you know, it's, uh, uh, they're, they're companies that, you know, have these sort of long drawn out ad campaigns that are created in advance, but we were able to do that in, um, I, there's no exaggeration when I say this, we were rolling cameras 24 hours after Peloton had called Mountain and said, do you guys have anything for us? We're in the middle of a very odd cultural moment because a uh, uh, television show has killed one of our uh, one of their their main stars on, on our product, unbeknownst to us. And uh, and we were able to respond in a way that was super agile and 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 fun. But, you know, none of this. You know, this is all. This is the the main reason that I was so excited about Maximum Effort merging with, with Mountain. And I, I know it's a bold thing to say, but really, I feel like Mountain is inevitable in this space. Uh, you know, much in the same way that you know Facebook was to social, and 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 you know, and and, and so on. And I think the rise of, of streaming services and the advancements in production and technology, we see it firsthand how it plays out in Hollywood. It's transformed Hollywood, and I think the rise of, of Avod. And the power of social, you could see this massive opportunity to transform CTV advertising. And, 
you know, merging with the leading performance TV platform that was going to help us on our journey in huge ways. So leveraging Mountain's platform and position in the CTV ecosystem, you know, that's that's that facilitating that relationship and the it's the impact that we want to make in that space and, and vice versa. It's just been such a mutually beneficial uh, experience for us. So talk to us about the creative process in that moment. You know, is it just coming out of your head? Are you in a writer's room throwing ideas back and forth? Are you throwing it up on a whiteboard? Like, how does it happen? You know, it happens kind of all of the above. You know, I mean, we, we at, at maximum effort, we have a team of, I would call them like 25 snipers. We have more ideas than places to put them. And that's that, that, that problem and that issue has been helped a tremendous amount by, by merging with, with Mountain. Um, we also have Quick Frame, which is, you know, in a massive creative uh, uh, company with it, with what I would characterize as, a, as an army of creatives. Uh, so, you know, allowing us to sort of deploy in so many different, with a vast different, uh, vastly different perspectives perspectives too uh, in our creative uh, wheelhouse it's been it's been really really amazing all right actor and mountains chief creative officer ryan reynolds along with founder and ceo mark douglas there you can catch that full interview at bloomberg.com we talk about some of their other ads as well coming up silicon valley not immune to the great resignation what big tech companies are doing to not just recruit but retain top talent this is bloomberg Amazon, Meta, Alphabet, Uber, they're not as coveted places to work as they used to be. Highly sought after employees are now leaving in mass to work for startups focused on crypto and Web3. Others just burn out by high expectations. For more, I'm joined by our Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Global Tech, Brad Stone. Brad, we're seeing also tech stocks coming down, whether it's Amazon or Meta, and that was a huge way that these companies have recruited and retained top talent is it getting harder it is I mean particularly retaining good employees you know the, the best engineers they have choices now they have geographic choices they have choice for which company they want to work for uh, when you talk about meta or Amazon where the stock prices have been either stagnant or down over the past year it's a very it's it, it impacts retention absolutely on the recruitment side, may, maybe there's upside then for an employee who wants to join and sees the stock price is low. But then you've got the PR problems, particularly around Meta, which is going to be a turnoff for a lot of employees. Amazon just raised the price of Prime, which did something good for the stock. Would they ever do a, a stock split like we saw with Alphabet? Could it come to that? I would say never say never. In the, in the 1990s, they split the stock a couple of times. It's now pretty expensive, you know, over $3,000 per share. You, you split the stock to make it more uh, accessible to retail investors, but also for employees. Um, right now, if you're a warehouse worker and you opt into the, the stock plan, you probably get fractional ownership of shares. So I do think that that is something Andy Jassy would look at. Mark Zuckerberg held an all-hands meeting to talk about the company's values. We've also seen Andy Jassy add a couple of new core values to the company. How does that play into this? You, you want your employees to feel good about where they work. And often these, these values, these leadership principles, they're, they're not, just, it's not just HR speak. These employees kind of marinate in these principles. It's how they make major decisions. It's how they hire. It's how they promote. And, and the new principles at Meta and at Amazon are all about acknowledging critics and saying we are conscientious companies. So I, I do think it's important. They're trying to restore the aura of good feeling that these companies make a positive contribution. And Microsoft is calling back its employees to the office on February 28th. They can still work in a hybrid mode, but that's the first big company we've seen put a date on it. And I wonder, are the other companies going to follow suit? And is the remote work policy going to decide the next war for tech talent? Yeah, it's a good question. Of course, here we are, Emily, in the, in the Bloomberg office uh, talking about this question. Um, look, I mean, if the pandemic really is ending, let's keep our fingers crossed. I think all these companies want to claw their workers back, at least for a couple of days a week. Um, I think there's a conviction that um, they move quicker, that innovation happens when people are in the office. So I do think Microsoft is probably a little bit of a bellwether here. Um, again, going back to the first part of the conversation, employees have choices. And probably for the tenured employees, the high-valued engineers, maybe they can leverage some more flexibility. All right, something we will be sure 
to watch. Bloomberg's Brad Stone, thank you very much. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're going to hear from Brian Chesky, CEO of Airbnb. Just about an hour and 15 minutes from now, stay tuned to Bloomberg Television. Harley Finkelstein with us tomorrow and a great roundup of guests. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.